Okay, everyone has to consent to being recorded. <clears throat> okay, so uh, it looks like um, everyone but the panelists is muted, which is good. Uh, let's get started. Uh, I am Jamal Green. I'm a professor at uh, Columbia Law School, uh, and I am the convener of this panel. This is, uh, as I think you know, if you're here, uh, a book panel. Uh, and so it is, I think, both appropriately a celebration of a book, uh, but also an opportunity to engage with the arguments of the book and to, and to push those arguments. Uh, the book is uh, Professor Yvonne Tu's book, A Constitutional Statecraft in Asian Courts. Uh, we have uh, what I think is a truly, thank you, Yvonne, uh, what is a truly uh, all-star panel uh, here, uh, including Professor Tu, uh, to discuss the arguments of the book and uh, where we might take them. Uh, the book, and I, I won't say much about it myself because we've got panelists to, to talk about it, but it's, it's a study of judicial power uh, within a particular setting. Uh, here in the United States, uh, we've been, of course, talking about judicial power a, a lot this week uh, in the context of confirmation hearings and threats of court packing and so forth. Uh, but the United States is, of course, a stable or stable stable-ish uh, Western democracy uh, that has had the power of judicial review for more than 200 years. And uh, many of the other kind of usual suspects in discussions of judicial institutional power uh, are, those discussions typically occur in the context of either European sort of Calcinian courts or the kind of spectacular power grabs of uh, the Indian Supreme Court or the Supreme Court of Pakistan, or in the, the many ways uh, idiosyncratic courts of South Africa or Israel or, or Colombia. Uh, Professor Tu's work focuses on a region that has received less study, especially in Western legal scholarship, uh, and that is uh, Southeast Asia in general, but uh, Malaysia and Singapore in particular. Those jurisdictions, Malaysia and Singapore, both uh, feature courts in contexts in which a judicial review is historically weak, in which there are strong uh, political and cultural traditions of uh, deference to the political actors, uh, in which there are long traditions of single party rule. And Professor Tu's book points to ways in which courts in these jurisdictions have gone and might go about trying to secure the conditions for effective judicial review in that challenging context. So with us to discuss those themes, um, we have as noted an all-star panel uh, and I'll just introduce them uh, just by name and affiliation so we can get into the substance uh, in order of speaking. And Tom, you've been nominated to speak first. So um, Tom Ginsburg from the University of Chicago Law School um, Rosalind Dixon from the University of New South Wales in uh, joining us from the future uh, tomorrow morning. Um, and uh, Ron Herschel from the University of Toronto uh, Faculty of Law. And then uh, to respond, uh, Professor Tu, last but not least of Georgetown University Law Center. And what I'm gonna do is I'll ask uh, the panelists to each talk for about 15 minutes. I'll then give Professor Chu a chance to respond, and uh, and then and then we'll take questions. And the way we'll do it looks like there's no uh, I don't see a raise hand feature here. So uh, we're probably a small enough group that if you have questions, you can either uh, raise your hand, uh, put yourself on video, and raise your hand. You can also address uh, me in the chat, uh, and I can either ask your question or I can direct you to, to identify yourself and ask your question on video. Uh, so uh, that's how we will proceed. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to Professor Tom Ginsberg. Wonderful. Thank you, Jamal, for organizing this. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I probably won't talk for 15 minutes, but I'll, I'll talk for a bit. Um, and I'm going to do something quite uncharacteristic for me, which is I'm going to begin by saying what I like about this book, because there really is a lot. Um, and so I just want to put on the table, you know, what the achievement is. I mean, first of all, these are pretty important jurisdictions in, um, you know, Singapore, a lot of people have been writing about authoritarian rule of law, not many people writing about Malaysia at all. 
Indeed, the only um, comparable work I can remember on Malaysian law is um, H.P. Lee, who apparently was Yvonne's PhD, uh, one of her examiners, and he's a sort of giant in Australia. But uh, so just that alone, like the descriptive achievement is really, really helpful. And I think anyone working on this field, um, you know, who's interested in those important jurisdictions will, will, will go uh, to this book. It's also really well written. Um, and I think she makes the case that it, these jurisdictions are important on a number of dimensions. There's so many of our contemporary issues in the field which um, are talked about here. Um, obviously, the role of emergency powers, the British legacy, post-colonial internal security acts, major issues there. Um, unconstitutional constitutional amendments, you know, ethnic pluralism, originalism. Um, someone on some listserv I was on actually that Mark Graber runs uh, was saying, oh, originalism is only American. And of course, Yvonne has long shown that that's not the case. Proportionality re review. Uh, the dynamics of drafting the Constitution, lots of issues. Okay, so it's super useful in this regard. The central story here is about, in my view, and maybe it's just because one of the things I'm interest, most interested in, is about the politics of judicial empowerment. Okay, and just for those who haven't read the book, you know, you have this very famous incident in Malaysia in 1988, where the courts uh, actually take jurisdiction over the internal rules of UMNO, of the ruling party, uh, and that they might hear a case which goes to the way prime ministerial candidates are selected. And Mahathir Mohammed just goes crazy and, uh, you know, essentially removes the jurisdiction of the courts to have judicial review. And what Yvonne's book centers around is that in the late 2010s, sort of out of nowhere, the courts self-empower. And I think that's just really an interesting story and um, uh, an important one. So. Um, now, two things about that, and this gets into the, the question of um, sort of, sort of challenges for Yvonne here. The first is you have the notion of constitutional statecraft. That's the title of the book. And that suggests that there are states men and states women who are making, you know, conscientious strategic choices in this very complex environment, ultimately leading to the empowerment of um, of, of, of the court uh, in the late period of Najib Razak. And um, I guess I wanted to know more. I wish I knew more about exactly why that happens when it happens. That's still a puzzle to me after reading your book. And I don't blame you for it. You're, a, you're writing as a lawyer and you make this contribution in comparative constitutional law, law. And you're very politically informed too. But it would be nice, maybe this is the next thing or just someone else should take this on. I wanted to know exactly why these judges did this when they did, because it's remarkable. The big election in which UMNO finally loses power doesn't happen until after this period. And so maybe there's a story, this would be my interpretation, that Mahathir's successor, Najib, is so busy stealing money out of the Malaysian treasury you know, he's got a billion dollar corruption scandal, that there was lots of internal stuff in the regime where things were slipping away. His internal control, no one was paying attention. And the court somehow sensed this and thus were able to self-empower. That might be one story. I gather from your discussion of Singapore, there's also a little bit of the story, which is that uh, there's a global discourse of judicial empowerment and judicial independence. And maybe we're, we can gather some space so that 2018 really is different from 1988 just in terms of the flow of these ideas. Uh, and there may be other reasons. And I guess I wanted to know more. And again, I'm not really criticizing you because it would be a slightly different method, but it would be a socio-legal method. And I think in this case, the socio-legal method would complement your story because you could go and talk to these judges and say, what were you doing? How did you see this? Um, and what was your decisions in terms of statecraft? Because for all of the, your book is quite convincing, but I don't have a general theory of exactly how the statecraft dynamics will work in another case. So um, that's, that's maybe the extension I think that you, you could do. Um, what else to say? I think that, um, um, uh, that, that the, um, let's see, what, what was my train of thought? I think that um, this question of the Singapore stuff is also super interesting. This is where, you know, 
Yvonne suggests, and it's a kind of predictable hypothesis that, you know, that, that there might be conditions under which the Singapore courts too would be able to move in the direction that the Malaysian court has. We don't know how that's going to work, um, but I would like to, like to, I'm certainly gonna be paying attention to finding out. One of the things in general I like about Yvonne's work is that these are, you know, I think they're super important, but I think, you know, tiny countries are important, right? I think, I thought, you know, outer Mongolia was like a really cool, you know, uh, case that small countries matter a lot. I think what you do really well, and this is a theoretical, uh, important theoretical contribution, is you're doing, if I can call it something that Asian studies people often say, we want people to theorize from Asia, to think about the problems of these constitutional systems, which as Ron has written about, are much more common, uh, you know, than the, or, you know, certainly common in different countries than the concerns of Western Europe and Australia and the United States, North America, which drive, have driven our agenda in comparative constitutional law. So, you know, I just want to see more of that. I think the stuff on religion is really great in this regard, um, you know, and um, your originalism point. I just think there's a lot of great things where we can take this theorizing from Asia and then see if you can develop some testable hypotheses we can extend to other similar countries where ethnic, you know, ethnic uh, pluralism is a fact of life, where the post-colonial state is still there, where there are issues like corruption um, and such, and see how judges can empower themselves in this very difficult environment. I'm gonna make one last comment, it's a total quibble. Each, and this is how I think about it, each of these chapters stands on its own. But when you read the book, there's one slight frustration, which is you re the, the facts of like the Indira Gandhi case come up in like every chapter almost. And so, you know, it's great for a teaching tool because you could just assign one chapter, it's totally complete. But as a volume, one has the feeling like, oh yeah, I know about Indira Gandhi. We met her in these various chapters. So that's my next, my suggestion for the next Yvonne Tu book, which I can say without qualification, I'm looking forward to. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I will turn it over to Professor Rosalind Dixon. Well, thank you, Jamal, and thank you for the opportunity and to Max Mo and everyone else who helped make the panel possible. It's a wonderful opportunity to celebrate Yvonne what is really a terrific book. Uh, and as people join us from all around the world to have this discussion at what is a different uh, and difficult time for the world, but it's still a great silver lining that we can all gather virtually to celebrate this really important uh, piece of academic scholarship. So like Tom, I had a bunch of questions about the sort of comparative politics story and the why story. But the more I delved into Yvonne's book, I thought that's not this book, that's the next one. And so I'm going to end my remarks, if you like, with some of the same themes as Tom about the why and the next book. But let me uh, start by saying what I think are the four key claims of this one and some questions that those claims raised for me. So the way I read uh, Yvonne's book is like Tom, a sort of exercise in constitutional theorizing from Asian cases. And it's especially welcome to do theorizing from Asia because most of our theorizing comes from either the US or the UK. And like Adrian Stone, I think people like Jeremy Waldron tell us they're doing theorizing for the world, but they really are driven by their experiences in countries like the UK and the US. And so it's really great to have theorizing done from elsewhere in ways that are really explicit about the link between theory and comparative practice. So I think that is one of the contributions of Yvonne's work and I think she does it uh, masterfully. I don't know what the gender neutral version of that word is, but it's really uh, a tour de force in describing the Singaporean and, and Malaysian experience, I agree with Tom, and connecting it to constitutional theory in a very skilled and explicit way. So, Yvonne basically says first that it is desirable for courts to play a role in democratic constitution protection and promotion, right? So building on the kind of Isakroff idea about hedging, but going further and saying that not only can they protect existing democratic uh, structures, they can help build them, but they need to do it strategically in order to succeed, but that it is a normatively desirable role for courts to play a role in democratic protection and promotion. Uh, 
And Yvonne takes on the kind of heroic view of, of history and says, you know, it's not just uh, Mahathir Mohammed who, who drove change in Malaysia, it's the courts and institutions. And that democracy depends as much, if not more on institutions than on individuals. So that's her first claim. And I think it's a very uh, powerful one, which I'm inclined strongly to agree with. The second claim she makes is in that countries like Malaysia and Singapore themselves, there is a legal institutional foundation on which this kind of function can build and rest, that there is a sufficient uh, historical basis, formal textual basis and institutional historical basis in which to think that this kind of account of the judicial role is realistic. It's not a kind of made up Yvonne Tu account, it's an account that is deeply resonant with existing tradition and basis in formal legal institutional authority. That's claim two. Her third claim, I think, is the slightly more, uh, you know, wishful thinking or optimistic one as regards to Singapore, but it's still uh, a plausible claim that this kind of uh, strong democracy protecting and promoting role is nascent within her Asian cases so that both Malaysia and Singapore have a sufficient incremental development toward assertive judicial review to think that her normative vision is at least uh, consistent with evolving trends. I think she's clearly right for Malaysia, but she's being a little hopeful uh, in relation to Singapore, but that's fine. Uh, I think being hopeful is uh, a good thing. And I think we should just acknowledge that it's a slight fudge for Singapore, hoping that that's the development rather than claiming completely confidently that it is. The fourth contribution or argument that Yvonne makes is to suggest that there are three key doctrinal tools and one prudential tool that aid courts in this kind of function. The three doctrinal tools are one, uh, purposive interpretation, two, proportionality analysis, and three, an unconstitutional amendment doctrine. And the fourth tool that Yvonne advocates is a kind of prudential tool that resembles Bekelian passive virtues, the kind of avoidance techniques that Erin Delaney has written about in the Duke Law Journal, that Sam Zakroff and I have written about in our piece, Living to Fight Another Day. And in, you know, in dialogue with those sorts of scholars, Yvonne says, judges need to get the timing really right. Uh, contrast, as Tom says, 1988 and 2018 in Malaysia. 88 was a disaster for judicial empowerment and review. 2018 was a success. That timing really matters, according to uh, Yvonne. And I think that that four plank argument is extremely compelling, uh, clear and beautifully illustrated and argued. But it does mean that Yvonne's work is more an argument in constitutional theory than it is in comparison, although it's both because she's not doing what Ron Herschel or Tom Ginsburg would do if they wrote this book, which is more of a comparative politics story about why we've seen the shift in Malaysia and to a lesser extent in Singapore. It's an argument that we should see a shift in the direction that Yvonne Tu favours. And I think that's really interesting and powerful, but it's important to uh, classify the book right because I think it is a work in constitutional theory founded in comparative experience rather than a work of comparative politics. If it were a work of comparative politics, my own view is that Singapore and Malaysia are a very fruitful sources of comparison, but I would want to flip the way Yvonne characterises Singapore. If this was a work in comparative politics, my urging to Yvonne would be to char characterise Malaysia as a success and Singapore as largely a, a failure or a case of stillborn democratic hedging. Maybe the baby, you know, is not uh, dead. Maybe that's too strong, but certainly not yet born at the very least. And one would characterise Malaysia as success, Singapore as not yet successful and try and see in Rahn's you know, most similar cases principle that he's so clearly and helpfully explained in his book, Comparative Matters and in his uh, earlier AJCL article, one would say, well, 
these cases are so similar in all the ways Yvonne tells us in the book, and yet they've had different outcomes. One has been empowerment, one has been non-empowerment, Singapore, and what explains the difference. But that's not the story Yvonne's telling, although Ran, Tom, and myself would all be interested in reading that article. It's the next chapter to be written either by Yvonne or someone else. And as Tom says, it's an invitation and a provocation. But I think if that were the story, one would want to recharacterize Singapore not as nascent, just like Malaysia, almost there, but really as failure or not yet success. So within more the confines of Yvonne's existing normative project, I wanted to really pose uh, you know, some questions about the extent to which her three doctrinal tools, purposive interpretation, proportionality, and an unconstitutional amendment doctrine are necessary conditions for the kind of democratic protection role she envisages for courts, and if so, in all global cases, or whether they're just helpful tools in some cases, and especially in the context of the Malaysian and Singaporean case. It seems to me that purposive interpretation is something that looks a little bit like, uh, in the hands of Yvonne, uh, Jack Balkan's living originalism. And as Tom says, that's no accident, right? Because Yvonne is one of the leading comparative originalists uh, globally. Uh, she's predisposed to be sympathetic to that kind of approach. And she renders it in a way that I think is very, very appealing, but basically is living originalist. And I think in Singapore and Malaysia, living originalism or purposive interpretation is a necessary condition for democratic hedging because the text is kind of sparse around democracy. It was written a while ago, right, in the 60s. And so you need a kind of purposive living originalist approach in order to give life to democratic hedging. But in Kenya, for example, the text itself might be explicit enough around democratic values that you could be a textualist and still engage in this kind of approach to judicial review. Conversely, in the United States, you don't need to be purposive. You can just be a pragmatist or a realist, a, a Dick Posner style Democrat and render decisions like Bush v. Gore, which for better or worse are an attempt at democratic hedging based on nothing that looks like purposive interpretation, but real politic pragmatism around the need for electoral resolution. So my claim is first that purposive interpretation is necessary, as Yvonne argues, in Singapore and Malaysia for democratic hedging, but not necessary globally. There will be cases where textualism or pragmatism would be just as adequate a basis for the kind of judicial role she envisages. But I'm interested in whether Yvonne agrees with that uh, as a characterization of the global reach of her theory. So that's my first question. Is purposivism always necessary or is it only necessary in your cases and sometimes there'll be textualist pragmatic bases for exactly the same result? Question two that's very similar around in proportionality. So Yvonne notes that proportionality is a nascent doctrine in uh, Singapore and Malaysia, much more established now in Malaysia. And she advocates building on you know, the wonderful work of Jamal and Vicky and a whole bunch of other folks on proportionality, the flexibility that proportionality doctrine can bring and how that can allow courts to mediate the tension between robust assertive uh, review and the strategic uh, values, the passive virtues she advocates. But again, I'm not sure it's necessary. It's helpful, right? But it might not be necessary because in the hands of the US Supreme Court, tiered scrutiny can do the work of uh, strategic avoidance and robust review. So again, my contention would be proportionality is helpful, but not necessary to the vision that Yvonne articulates. Her third doctrinal category, unconstitutional amendment, is likewise something which may not be necessary globally, which is it's going to be necessary in systems with relatively easy constitutional amendment either formally easy or because, as in Malaysia and Singapore, one has a history of dominant party democracy. So again, I think unconstitutional amendment doctrine is a close to necessary part of the toolkit in Malaysia and Singapore. It will also be necessary in countries that have those same characteristics of pretty easy amendment, either formally or de facto, but it need not be part of the toolkit in 
uh, countries where amendment is much more difficult as a matter of form or as Tom and James Melton and others have shown as a matter of practice or constitutional culture. So my, my ultimate question to you, Yvonne, is are those three doctrines always necessary? Are they only necessary in Malaysia and Singapore? And that really invites us to think about the global reach of what Yvonne is saying. Normatively, she makes a global case for the role of courts, but the doctrinal tools that she identifies, in my view, may be helpful tools in a bunch of countries, but probably only necessary uh, in the countries that she identifies. And what does that tell us about the relationship between, if you like, the purpose of judicial review and the tools of judicial review? Are they contingently linked by politics and circumstances uh, or are they more tightly linked by some sort of normative conceptual ideal? That's really my closing uh, question. But I love the book and like Tom and uh, I'm telling you what you're going to say, Ron, and I, I, I don't presume to do so, but you know, would love to see the Herschel Ginsburg version of this book uh, 2.0, which is the story of the why of judicial empowerment. In fact, I was recommending your book just yesterday to a Sri Lankan PhD student of mine for that very purpose. But I take that to be the next big project. And this one is magnificent and big and ambitious and I think a lot more normatively focused. Thank you, Roz. Um, I will turn it now to Professor Ron Herschel. Oh, well, thank you, Jamal. And thanks, uh, Yvonne, for writing such a thought-provoking book. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in from, I think, what is literally 15 different time zones or more. Um, so that's terrific, and um, um, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, there's very little left to say after such, uh, you know, as Jamal said, myself notwithstanding uh, an all-star team. So um, after such a thoughtful book and two comments by Tom and Ross, there's very little to say, but I, I will try to add some, uh, my own twist to the comments and questions. Uh, first of all, I want to sing the book praises, and this is not just because this is customary, but because this is a terrific scholarly accomplishment. I've known Yvonne for, I believe, 12, 13 years. We met for the first time when I visited at Harvard Law School back in 2007, 2008. She was doing her LLM then. We were both much younger. Uh, she stood out uh, at the outset as a very promising student. And um, I'm not surprised at all that uh, sometime later she produced such a terrific piece of work. It was obvious at the outset that this would be the case. And I must say that this, that uh, Richard Albert um, also did his LLM at that time. Um, and uh, so this was quite a crop. I mean, quite a, quite a, quite a class it was. Um, so I think the three main strengths of the book to me, first of all, um, the seldom explored cases that he deals with in such depth and thoughtfulness. So of course, many of us have written about this. Um, as Tom said, we have some works on Singapore, mainly in the context of constitutional author authoritarianism, but far less so on Malaysia and Yvonne cites my own work on this. Uh, in constitutional theocracy in saying that to me, Malaysia is one of the most fascinating constitutional and legal settings in the world. It's so complex and so nuanced and so many things are happening that it's a living laboratory for everyone who's interested in constitutional theory in the global south, the constitutional politics in the global south. So that's a major accomplishment. The second, and I'm glad that Kim uh, tuned in this is a great work of what Kim called some, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, constitutional uh, ethnography. Uh, we can argue uh, whether anthropologists would agree to the term ethnography, but to the extent that there is constitutional ethnography, this is it. And it's in the same league as uh, Wojciech's uh, work on Poland and, you know, or in-depth study of uh, given constitutional system. So that's a major accomplishment. Just the amount of knowledge that went into this is incredible. The third thing is, and I agree with Rod here, this is not a work in comparative constitutional politics, although both at least Tom and I would have liked it to be. But uh, 
um, it offers a very thought-provoking toolkit or arsenal of uh, methods, mainly interpretive methods that co uh, courts may uh, endorse and advance in the context of fighting for democracy in fragile settings or in fragile democracies. But since this is a book panel and we are not here just to sing the book praises, I also have some questions. So uh, maybe three, and some of this will simply echo what has been said already. First of all, and it's inevitable when it comes from me, the politics of it. So uh, I think Yvonne may be making too much of a bunch of decisions that were decided over the last 24 months. And even that, I'm not sure. So this is stuff that clearly something happens in 2018 in Malaysia. And of course, Yvonne, you will correct me if I'm wrong, but in February 2020, there was then a reversal of some of these things, not at the judicial level, but at the political level. And you refer to it, I'm guessing, in the 11th hour in the conclusion of the book, probably two or three paragraphs before the end, you just say something about it and you say that you're still hopeful. But maybe Indira Gandhi and a couple of other cases from a social science standpoint is just too few data points, so to speak, to draw such a, a broad and all-inclusive comprehensive conclusion that you, so, so, so you may be slightly overstate the claim that these recent Malaysian decisions have quote unquote entrenched anything. And as you so, you know, you document so beautifully throughout the book, there have been so many flip flops, at least in the Malaysian context and politicians trying to pass amendments and stuff like that left and right. So I am not fully convinced, again, from a social science standpoint, that there is sufficient data here, so to speak, and excuse the social science language to substantiate the far reaching broad claim that is at least implicit. I agree that it's not a work in comparative constitutional politics, but there is at least an implicit claim here that courts have been serving as a sort of democratizing agent to some degree, at least in Malaysia and maybe in Singapore as well. Although as Ross said, I'm not sure if in Singapore this captures the, but to me, the, the most more fascinating element of the story you tell is Malaysia, I'll be frank. It's a much more complex story than, than Singapore to me. Okay, the second point I wanna make is some of the decisions, again, and I'm referring mainly to the Malaysian story, some of the decisions you, you, you refer to and analyze, including Indira Gandhi, but others, may be characterized not so much as cases about democracy or substantiating democracy, but more cases about jurisdictional wars between the general court system and the religious, mainly Sharia court system. So in Malaysia, this is a big deal, obviously. And of course you acknowledge this, but when you talk about these decisions, you tend to assign uh, the, federal, the Malaysian federal court um, a say, or you frame these decisions as, a, as, a, as, a, as decisions that may advance democracy in some, in some abstract way. But ultimately, the, some of these decisions may be characterized as essentially wars over jurisdiction, jurisdictional turf. And it's not surprise maybe uh, that in 2018, when it's not really a religious coalition, but certainly more religious than the establishment before it, that the court stands on its, you know, on its feet and in, in, in makes a statement in that ultimately it's going to be, I don't want to say secular, but you know, the civilizational Islam version of secularism in Malaysia that is going to determine and ultimately we have the final say. And if we compare this to earlier decisions, we see that maybe the main difference is not so much pro-democracy, but more 
secular or general court jurisdiction over religious matters. And in that respect, I, I also note a certain, I don't want to say discrepancy, but maybe it's not exactly in line with one of your earlier articles that I teach all the time in, in, um, in um, uh, comparative constitutionalism and religion, you know, on theocracy by still. And there you engage with my argument in constitutional theocracy and you suggest in that article that maybe religious bodies use or draw on the constitutional system in Malaysia to advance their cause. And then two years later, you argue in this book, at least that's my understanding of some of, of, of the cases you analyze, that maybe it's more the court now stands stands on its, feet, on its feet as an independent court and advances a more, I don't want to say secularist, but you understand what I'm trying to say, a more or a less, less um, Sharia court um, oriented um, um, jurisprudence. So I guess my second point is to make a long story short, maybe some of the decision, decisions in Malaysia may be recharacterized as decisions on jurisdictional wars between the general statist court system and the religious Sharia court system. And we know that this has, has, has had roots in earlier Malaysian jurisprudence for decades. My third point is your reference to occasional, but it hovers over the book somehow, your ref reference to so-called Asian values, and the idea that maybe courts in the region are converging upon some sort of Asian constitutional jurisprudence in a way that takes the, the interpretive and heuristic tools that Roz mentioned, you know, the, that menu of three categories and give it an Asian twist or an Asian flavor or an Asian interpretation. And here, again, I'm no expert in this entire Asian values debate, but to me, so um, I don't know uh, how many of you are familiar with the work of this great sociologist, Sami Smucha, who in uh, the 70s and 80s coined the term ethnic democracy to characterize uh, countries such as Malaysia or Israel or Sri Lanka, or to some extent, um, Pakistan and India, the countries where the constitutional order, but I think Malaysia is a typical case where the constitutional order is at the same time committed to preferential treatment of part of the population. And in the case of, case of Malaysia, of course, quote unquote, ethnic Malays, and at the same time to general principles of democracy, including equality before the law and minority rights and religious freedoms and all these things. So there are not too many countries like that, but it strikes me that in the context of the rise of so-called nationalist populism over the last 10, 15 years around the world, we see more and more countries that accentuate the ethnic aspect over of belonging over the democratic one. And it seems to me that the real comparison here is not between Malaysia and Singapore. And, and I, I honestly don't think that these countries share that much in common as you described. Of course, they share history and many other aspects, but I would think that a place like Israel or like Sri Lanka would be um, a more suitable comparative cases to the Malaysian case, precisely because Israel defines itself as Jewish and democratic. And in India, we know that there is this strong tendency over the last 10, 15 years to emphasize some Hindu national um, elements at the expense of other, at the same time, there is a strong protection of other values as in the you know, annulment of the talak divorce practice and, and, and other cases. So I guess my third point is, are we talking about some sort of Asian values contribution to the repertoire of constitutional interpretation? Or is it 
more like the ongoing struggle in Malaysia and in other places between the deep ethnic oriented constitutional identity of the polity to borrow from Jacobson and a more universalist cosmopolitan understanding of what the polity stands for. And it's not so much about then Asian values or indeed Asia at all, as it is about this struggle between those two competing values and how that struggle manifests itself differently in Hungary or in India or in Israel or in Malaysia. But the core problem seems to me that problem of particularism versus universalism. Anyways, to conclude, we put a lot on the table, the three of us, but to conclude, this is a terrific scholarly accomplishment. And uh, I want to congratulate you on producing it. Um, I look forward to the second book because if this, so I view this as an appetizer really. And uh, um, I, I would encourage you to do more. Um, so thanks again for writing it and thanks again for uh, inviting all of the all of us to engage in this really fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, and uh, I will turn to Professor Tu to respond to that very rich set of uh, observations. So the floor is yours. Well, first off, I just have to say how delighted and thrilled and honored I am to have such a rich discussion with um, truly an all-star panel. Uh, it's as if all the books that I had on my bookshelves, even as a graduate student, and then uh, you know, coming to comparative constitutional law have come to life and are here engaging. And I think there's, uh, and I'm, so I'm deeply, deeply appreciative and grateful to Jamal for organizing this panel uh, and to Roz, Ran, and Tom, who are really a dream team of comparative constitutional law and politics. I mean, the, the, the work that each of you have done, which I think the book tries to engage with, uh, is, has, has really been pathbreaking and shaped the feel of comparative constitutional law from Tom's work on judicial review in new democracies, which I discovered as a young undergraduate law student in the Cambridge Law Library stacks. Uh, and, Rand's work on, you know, juristocracy, constitutional theocracy, obviously has been hugely impactful and generative for me, particularly in the role with role of religion in a context of Malaysia, uh, which is a pluralistic legal order of civil courts and religious courts. And the, uh, the phrase that Rand uses about how Malaysia is arguably one of the most fascinating and complex studies for studying that intersection, I have unashamedly borrowed several times and quoted in many of my work. So thank you for that. And Raz, you know, uh, your work on judicial statecraft and strategy and, and responsive judicial review and different forms of judicial review is it has been immensely influential in my thinking about courts, statecraft, a subject that, of course, I find intriguing, as you can see from the title of my book um, and your work on judicial de deferral. All of that has been just, all of you have been so hugely influential in the writing of not only this book, but in general, all my other work as well. And I, and I think all of this just, I want to say one last thing to highlight one, uh, one aspect about Raz, Ran, and Tom that links all of them besides their wonderful work in the field, which is um, the fact that we're having this panel, this engagement across several countries and time zones, it, it bears noting that the extraordinary engagement and support and generosity for other scholars in the field, and particularly younger scholars like myself who are following in paths that have already been defined by these trailblazers, I think is something I find deeply, uh, that I, that I'm deeply grateful for and really very appreciative. So thank you um, for that engagement. So on to like the book itself. So there's a lot, there was a lot out there. So there's a lot on table. I'll say a few broad points to respond to some of that. And then of course, happy to speak about any of this in more detail. Um, so I think first on the, on the point that has come up a couple of times on the comparative politics story here, I think I'll say, I'll say two broad things about it. One is that I think you're right, all of you, and 
and so eloquently put that sometimes I wish I could just hear all of you just go on about this. But you're right that this book, I think, was for me the more normative, the more normative story. So it's a it's a it's a normative argument, I think, in terms of how I see the judicial role playing out in these contexts and the types of tools that the courts can use to advance that. And I'll say a little bit of tools in my second point, Roz, on, on, in your question there. But on the particular comparative point, like I th on comparative politics point, I think like in this case, it was meant to, to be a, a normative account of both judicial review and the role in these contexts. I will say, since a number of you have already uh, mapped out my research trajectory and agenda, that in fact, my next law review article is titled Strategic Judicial Empowerment. And that is like the, the, the project I'm turning to next. I'm delighted, in fact, that Tom and Roz and Ran, all of you have mentioned that that should be a natural next point because that, uh, that, that aspect, the comparative, sort of the broader comparative politics aspect um, and the, and the uh, comparative judicial politics role of what the courts are doing was one that I think was triggered by this book. I didn't want to get into it in a huge amount of detail here because that was a different argument, but I, I am looking at it in my next project, which looks beyond Malaysia. So it's also looking at a bunch of different places, Pakistan, Malawi, the UK, and the recent Malay decision, and, and, and the Malaysian cases. But what I'm looking there, I think, would be things like, what are the factors and conditions under which this type of self-empowerment by a judiciary happens across these types of contexts? So, I mean, issues that we've talked about before, like that Ross has brought up already, like timing matters, but also things like coalition thing, uh, the judicial optics of unanimity, judicial leadership, legacy, uh, rhetorical strategies that the courts have used, most of which you see in some of these Malaysian cases, but I think you also see more broadly in a number of different contexts. So that's the sort of next next stage that I'm that I'm looking at. The next step, the next project that I'm looking at will be looking specifically at this idea of strategic judicial empowerment, more from an analytical phenomenon perspective. Whereas this book, I think, is making the claim that here in these contexts um, and in contexts like these, uh, this is the this is the the vision that I have in terms of constitutional statecraft for these judges and for these courts. So having said that, I want to say a little bit of political context uh, to, to bring to address some of what Ryan uh, questioned, right, in terms of political context and, what, and, and how, you know, politics matter. And, I think political context undoubtedly matters. I mean, part of the reason why the judges in these contexts have been so restrained has been because of this history of dominant political party rule. And so what happens with 2018 and what happens with 2020, um, I think it's true that in the Malaysian case, as has been pointed out, there has been some of the reaction that we're seeing here from the judiciary is a reaction to sort of the expansion of political space that occurred, right, in 2018. But even before that, perhaps, like in 2008, when they lost it, when the ruling party lost the ability to amend the constitution. So I think the, the expansion of political space tells part of that story. That tells part of the story about why the, um, the court became much more assertive in that period. I think there are, other, there are other aspects that we can look to if we were gonna parse that, like things like judicial selection and appointments, there's been greater diversity in terms of women, minorities, et cetera, on the bench, but you do have a sort of generational cadre of judges that were appointed in the Mahathir era who are still there, right? And so I think like the external political story certainly tells part of that story. I think one of the things that, that, that sort of intrigued me, and I, and I think 2018, the 2018 and 2020 transitions uh, are both as a very fundamentally different type of political transitions. But the cases that I'm talking about happened before that. So the, the Simone Jaya Indira Gandhi cases happened before 2018. And I don't, and I know that those two get a lot of space in the book, but I also do trace a trajectory all the way from 2010, you know, sort of like the beginnings of the, the judicial assertion. I think you, it starts there and you sort of see it building up and then you sort of see the boom, boom moments in these two broad bigger cases in 2017 and 18, which occurred just before this government transition in 2018. So the story is not so much the courts, I think, deciding for in 2018 that, uh, okay, now we can do this thing because the government is no longer in power. No one, I think, thought that the, the ruling party was going to go out of power. I certainly didn't. And uh, no, not many people did from even those in Malaysia that I've spoken to in great detail. So I think there is a story there that what the court was doing is it was, de it was dealing with whatever opportunities it had before it, 
while still under a dominant party regime, although one that might have been slightly weakened, and laying the foundations for being able to negotiate that uh, even in a regime that didn't look so fundamentally different. And then when the 2018 transition happened, and I think that was kind of a moment where uh, it was an unexpected, sort of unprecedented opportunity for the courts if they, if they had uh, if they wanted to move on that, I think like that was really like a golden opportunity, but an unexpected one for them to do. So I think that's, so I think political context certainly makes a difference, but ultimately I think my account in this book focuses more on internal judicial self-perception. What is it about like the judges that might, that might um, call for a shift in judicial approach to constitutional adjudication and what are the sort of judicial tools they could develop towards this. And so let me say, as my second point, I want to say something about the tools of statecraft just uh, that Roz brought up, um, where she asked like whether these are necessary across all contexts or, nece or more necessary in the context of Malaysia and Singapore, things like purposive interpretation, proportionality, uh, unconstitutional, constitutional review. And I think Another way of putting that, right, is that if is it the case that if judges have these general tools, we can expect these tools to to build constitutionalism across different contexts, or is it a case of assuming we have capable judges, and these judges are looking for ways in these in these types of fragile democracies in Asia to perform their role along that dimension of protecting constitutional democracy, then these are the tools the judges can use to good effect. And I think it has to be the latter, right? So I think ultimately those adjudicative strategies that I'm talking about are tools and strategies that do just that in these contexts, because it makes sense in these contexts. When you have a judiciary that has been famously reticent and deferential for years, uh, and with a type of textual constitution of the sort that you know, as Roz explained, like has, has, does not, ex has functions for judicial review and has a bill of rights, but doesn't explicitly say in a way that maybe the South African constitution or the Kenyan constitution does, the types of tools that judges should use, then I think that in these situations, the, the, the judges here reach for adjudicative strategies like the ones I described, because it's the kind of strategies that help the courts become more effective as institutions to wield some form of constitutional constraint on political power and also gives them the flexibility to construct and build sort of principles and constitutional norms that they can use going forward. So something like purposivism or I think proportionality in a context like Malaysia and Singapore sort of builds, allows courts to assert power incrementally if they have to, but also in a more robust way in some other contexts. And I think that's what another strand of my argument is that when the federal courts seek to assert power, they must do so strategically. And so they use, they have to use these cool, they employ these tools effectively to judicial statecraft or statesmanship. Um, so these are judges that are not what a phrase that I love from Roz Dixon, these are not like B minus judges, right? Like these are tools for judges who are, who, are, who are looking to be able to construct or build uh, and are sensitive to strategic considerations like timing of decisions, like when to use a particular tool in a way that won't provoke immediate political backlash. And I think like that's a concept that I explore more broadly in the next project, but it's also one that I think comes out in this case to kind of show where these judiciaries are here. Um, the other thing I was going to say was on the the Singapore Malaysia story. So the third the third point on the or that that came up in a number of comments about are they similar are they different uh where where are they i think in in some ways I, and i like the idea that maybe singapore looks more like the stillborn baby story and then malaysia's the success story that's one account they could also be i think what i'm trying to say with this account is like the malaysian story um and the singapore story looked very similar 10 years ago right they're both dominant party democracies they're both they both have sort of a very a single ruling party that's been in place since independence and then in the malaysian context that changes um and we also see a broad change in the role of the courts and in the judicial assertiveness that courts are doing. So broadly speaking, the account could be seen as a narrative of courts at different stages and with different configurations of political power negotiating that institutional role vis-a-vis -vis the particular configuration of political power in that constitutional order. So 
where they are on those points in the spectrum of constitutional statecraft are, of course, then influenced by numerous other factors like external political context. Some courts may be further or less far along that spectrum. Will Singapore get there? I mean, the normative, the normative account is like, well, if they want to get there, like this is what I, this is where my book provides an account of. This is the normative uh, idea of where Singapore could could go. If it doesn't get there, then perhaps it is the exemplar. I mean, Singapore is a typical exemplar at this point, right, of a dominant party system that it, that has to have dealt with authoritarian constitutionalism and seems to continue down that con down that route. Whereas its closest neighbor. Um, has taken a very different approach, at least recently. But this will be, and my, so my last point on that, on, on, on Malaysia specifically, because Ron brought up the law and religion uh, point of view, is that, uh, I, yes, I do think some of those decisions may be characterized as jurisdictional turf wars. Um, and I, and, you know, and your work obviously in constitutional theocracy is one that I have, have engaged deeply with and, and think has been hugely influential in my work in stealth theocracy. And um, in stealth theocracy, that was written just before the Indira Gandhi case, and then Indira Gandhi happened, right? So I think one of the things that happened there is a question about like what, it's still the case, I think, that you have a, a, a a trend of courts for many, many years going down a particular route of uh, Islamization. And then you have sort of this judicial assertion of power that is both, I think, correctly, as you point out, like a story about secularization in, in the Indira Gandhi case, but it's also a story about strategic, about judicial empowerment for the civil courts. And then again, I can question there, the broader question there for me was like, why does that happen in that case? And how does that happen? And I think you see, uh, you see like strands of that. This is just not a total outlier. It builds on jurisprudence that has already been laid, on, laid down. The judges, the one or two judges in that case that brought the court together with a unanimous decision, had probably had an eye to judicial legacy. All of these things suggest that there's been a shift in judicial self-perception to some extent for these courts to want to, to be willing to want to take this type of position. And, um, and I think in the Malaysian con context, it's always going to be complex because you're right, there's a deep ethnic and religious identity conflation. Um, religion might sometimes just be an epiphenomenon, right, for a deeper ethnic identity type of, type of issue. But ultimately, and so ultimately, I think it's, a, the, it's even more, I think, in, in, to my mind, it was even more interesting that in a case that would have dealt with such a fraught area of law in the Malaysian context, the jurisdictional authority between the civil and Sharia courts, that the civil courts took this fairly assertive stance, or not fairly assertive, like very assertive stance, and said it is clear from our constitutional order the civil courts have the power uh, hierarchical power over the Sharia courts. And not only that, we also have the power to strike down Parliament's constitutional amendments. That's a pretty robust move for a court in a asserting fairly fragile authority. And I think that's, a, that's an interesting complex story that, that deals both with religion, but also deals with this idea of judiciaries, uh, judiciary seizing power at a particular moment of opportunity. So I think I'll stop there in terms of my responses to these questions, but I'm happy to speak about any of these issues in, in further discussion, but I do also want to open up to any other discussions from the floor or anyone else. But thank you again so much to all the panelists. I'm so deeply uh, humbled and, and honored to have all of you here to discuss this. It's really a treat and I'm, and I'm very excited at this discussion. Thank you again. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, we have heard from uh, the panelists and we've heard from Yvonne. Uh, I think there's a lot more that one could say. I'm going to open the floor to um, the two audience members. So as uh, Kim has already discovered, uh, you can use the raise hand function uh, to, um, uh, to get on the queue. And I'll just ask if you can identify, we, have, we see your names, but if you can identify your institutional affiliations and uh, I will uh, hand it over to uh, Kim Shepley. Hi, so I'm in, in a house at the, at the end of a dirt road at the end of a long driveway. Otherwise, I'm affiliated with Princeton. <laughs> um, so Yvonne, this is a great um, accomplishment. And um, what I wanted to ask is something about the I think that we all wrestle with this when we study these high courts is about the nature of our explanation relative to what the actors themselves think they're doing, right? So how much of your account of these courts do you think they would agree with? And how much do you think would be edgy? 
So I think this is just the problem when we all study people who might read what we say. So how do you square that circle? And Yvonne, before you before you answer, I, I, I will I, I will construe uh, any of the questions as questions for, for any of the panelists who, who want to weigh in. But Yvonne gets first crack. OK, well, um, that's a great question, uh, Kim. And it's great to see you, Kim. So I think I will say to that that well, there are several ways that we, there are several different dimensions we can take that, right? We, uh, we can take that at the judicial level. We can take that about uh, constitutional litigators. We can take that in about scholars, both in Malaysia and outside, or or in on the fragile democracy regions in Asia more generally. So let me, but I think like maybe your your initial point said it was about the internal actors, as in the judges themselves. So I'll say a little bit about that. Well, I think there are two types of. I think it speaks differently to two types of judges. And here again, I'm going to uh, I'm going to use Raz's phrase of the B minus judges and the the ones that are trending higher on the curve kind of judges. So if we're talking about the not B minus judges, the ones that are trending above B plus, so top of the curve judges, then I think like there is a that my sense from those decisions that we've had is that there's a robust and quite a vibrant significant minority. I mean, they're not yet the majority, but they are the judges who managed to pull the center, right? You see this in the, the unanimous decisions in both Sumanya Jai and Indira Gandhi means that there, that there was, it wasn't just a divided court. There were judges there. And in both cases, it was written by the same judge as a woman judge just before her retirement in several months. Um, and it was very Marbury-esque in the sense of the reasoning just had all this stuff about judicial independence, the courts need to be, the courts are the bulwarks in this situation. It took all these like jabs at the, the kinds of uh, amendments that the government had done in the past for, for judicial review. And I think like, it very much looked like a judicial legacy or a, a judicial legacy type of opinion. So my sense is that for those, and you see this before as well, and even the Lena Joy case that Rand will know very well, like Richard Mulanjum, the dissenting judge there, right? They robust dissent, really robust dissent about freedom of religion in this apostasy case. So you've, we've always had those kinds of, you've always seen those, you do see these kinds of judges pop up throughout. And I think like gaining a sort of more critical mass as they go along. So for those judges, I think like the internal view is one that is looking to, well, one that it's like strengthen their own institutional authority, but also push towards a particular type of constitutional vision uh, of which like what I'm doing here, I think is providing them with both the larger constitutional theory account as well as a specific judicial toolkit to say that if that's what you're trying to do and you're already on that path, uh, then here are the kinds of legal tools that could be used effectively in charting that path forward. To the B minus judges, I would say that it forces some type of judicial reckoning, right? I, maybe, which is that I think for too long there was a, it, there has been a very sort of the conventional view is that for Asian judges in these type of contexts with a consolidated political power and you know with the rhetoric of Asian values, even though I agree with Rand that it's, you know the, it's, it's rhetoric, but still it was a very useful rhetoric for a lot of judges to use it as a as a blanket or curtain for, for judicial, for very extensive judicial deference, right? And for saying that anything that's not, that, you know, we're rejecting this of individualistic Western liberal notions. Uh, and, and therefore, this justifies the type of, the type of like, reticence that we show in these cases. And I wanted to ground this book or this constitutional adjudication approach to be contextually specific and attentive or and attentive to the local context, although drawing on these broader uh, constitutional theory ideas that can that, that go beyond Malaysia and Singapore, but in the Malaysian Singapore context, for a judge to then now reject this, I think I would like them to have to have judicial reasoning that that suggests, you know, that um, it presents them with an alternative route that even if they purport not to agree with, uh, would have the I think they I would like them to then have to explain why this doesn't work in a constitution in in this specific constitutional context now that i've given a detailed account of why it does um and that links i think maybe one last point i'll say on that that links to maybe if you think that b minus judge might not want to engage with that there's a very robust uh constitute public law litigation rights litigation community that has i think risen over the past 
several years, particularly in Malaysia, right? It has a very vibrant and robust bar. You see a rise of public law litigation. Many of these cases, the law and religion ones that Ran and others have talked about are brought by civil society activists, lawyers, and there's a growing culture of, I think, constitutional rights, constitutionalism. So those actors are acting actively trying to advance a particular constitutional vision. And I think like this is one way that I think they can bring it and frame it and front it before the courts. And some judges will take it and some judges, uh, I like to think, will at least have to explain why they disagree with this approach rather than having the easy way out. But thank you for that question. Uh, Ron, you had a follow up? Yes, just a quick follow up in a, in a, in a minute. In I think I, 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 I it, it, you know, talk a little bit about the spatial difference between Singapore and Malaysia and uh, what areas and regions the judges represent. So as we all know in Singapore, everyone knows everyone and everyone went to the same one or two law schools and it's one big, just the entire separation of powers doctrine in Singapore is just spatially speaking uh, I don't want to say ridiculous, but it's uh, up there. Uh, when you so so you know, all events at the NUS, uh, the judicial elite shows up and they talk to the dean and they talk to the students and just to imagine that those judges will take a, you know, a a distinctly different position than the political governing elite in that country slash city is uh, is difficult. But Malaysia is a federal country for all practical purposes. And, 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 and in some states, the very tensions you talk about in the book are more expressed and manifested than in others. So, you know, Keda and others, can you say something, and this is a direct follow-up to Kim's question, can you say something about the, you know, the regional element in, in the ideas or interests that the federal court judges represent? Do, do they have any regional voice at all? Or is it that they grow out of a system that makes them all say the same, look the same, talk the same? Mm. Well, I think one big difference between Malaysia and Singapore is the religious and ethnic uh, divisions that are much more apparent, I think, in Malaysia. And I, and I think Singapore is much more homogenous in a lot of different ways, right? Whether we're talking intellectual diversity, as you brought, as you as you mentioned earlier, or also uh, issues like race and religion. I think in Malaysia, the whole the 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 fact that you might have Malay Muslim judges both on the civil courts as well as the Sharia courts. Uh, you have judges from from Borneo. And this is the federal system point. You know, you have judges from East Malaysia and West Malaysia and different states. I think like. I think as with most things, and I can say this as, a, as, a, as having grown up in Malaysia, right? Although my Singaporean colleagues might disagree, I think like Singapore is much more uniform, much more efficient and much more effective. Uh, but, but Malaysia, the Malaysian, the Malaysia is, has, it's not as effective and therefore there are gaps. And in those gaps, I think those kinds of, uh, there, is, there is more space for creativity in different ways, whether that's in the judiciary, whether that's in the legal system, whether that's in the political system, there's more uh, complex, there's more conflicting strengths. And so I think like in, the, in a context like uh, the Malaysian judiciary, you do, you have, I think like the tensions there tend to also fall down some of these lines that we've talked about in the society at large. So there's race, there's religion, there's um, the, the, you know, the, the secular, the supposed divide between secular, liberal, urban versus the more religious, conservative factions, where they go to school, like some of them come from the International Islamic University in Malaysia, right? And others go, and uh, the traditionally might, might have gone to, to your elite institutions out of the country and then come back to the country. So you have, like, I think, like a lot of variety in terms of the different communities of judges in these contexts. And in the Malaysian case, I think it's much less homogenous than in, in Singapore. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Roz, was that a, a is that a- Yeah, um, I just wanted to follow up yeah. what I said in, in the chat. I, I think it's really interesting, Kim, your question about what would they say? And I think it's worth distinguishing what would they say publicly 
versus what might they be willing to say if they really trusted you and sat down and for a kind of off the record interview, because it really presses on the difference between are they conscious of the strategy that they're adopting and what would happen if the strategy were known. And I think one of the really interesting things about statecraft is, you know, for it to succeed, it can't be too transparent actually. Right. And so they probably can't say it out loud. Well, we're trying to like put checks on the government, but not too many checks that they push back. And so the kind of the diplomacy aspect of successful statecraft means that I guess my conjecture would be at least the judicial players, the civil society players can probably say it out loud, but the judicial players could never say it publicly because the very fact of doing so would defeat the strategy. Mm -hmm. Whereas they might be willing to say this stuff uh, in a really confidential way. But my experience, you know, I, I did this really interesting project with Vicky Jackson about foreign judges on national courts, where we interviewed a bunch of judges who sat uh, on the final courts in, in Fiji, uh, in Bosnia and in Hong Kong. And trying to get them to be candid was really hard. And we got some degree of candor on the um, undertaking that we weren't too candid publicly, but it, it is very hard. And I think it takes a lot of trust. And you've got that kind of trust when you've done ethnographic work, but it's hard. And so I think it's worth delineating the, what could they, what are they conscious of what they're doing and what would they say in a really trust, you know, based confidential environment versus, um, you know, not, I've developed this friendship with the chief, former Chief Justice of Australia, Sir Anthony Mason, who I think was an exemplar of statecraft. And he's 95 and probably doesn't have that much time left. And trying to get him to be candid with me, even though we have a good friendship, is, you know, I've got more out of him over the years, but it's still really hard. So judges who are really good at this, obviously keep it quite close to their chest. And so the A plus people, again, I'm not sure I'm willing to be on the record for that, but the A plus judges are really good at politics and diplomacy. So they really don't let out what their strategy is to almost anyone, which makes researching it really tricky, I think. And that's one of the things Vicky and I conclude with. We said that it's really hard to figure out what foreign judges do because the best ones will never be able to figure out what they did because mm -hmm. their fingerprints won't be all over the the judgments because the very fact of the fingerprints make people kind of hostile and in Bosnia it was so obvious what they did that everyone hated them whereas in Hong Kong it was so subtle that no one could ever say what they exactly did other than that they contributed in in some way and so I feel like especially in Malaysia it would be really tricky because the very fact of candor might unravel that 2018 moment in ways that are even more stark than as Ran said the 2020 kind of kind of retrogression if you like. I mean, I think, sorry, go on, Kim. I, and then I'll I'm just going to add a two finger on that, which is, so one of the reasons why I raised this is that there's a kind of normative question about the work that we do, right? So if you publish a book that says, here's what they're doing, <clears throat> but they have plausible deniability, then does it, does it do something in the space, you know, or not? And if, if they admit to it, I mean, anyway, so I just, I'm just curious about how you handle that question, because it does seem to me that especially when we have sort of normative arguments we're making about what would be helpful, what would work, what 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 has been um, sort of extraordinary in what a court has done. And in some ways, especially when you do it sort of from the outside, that it opens up that court to a certain kind of criticism unless, and I was really lucky in Hungary, the judges just, you know, I could talk to them about it. They would talk to me. I lived there for four years. I saw them every day. You know, in the end, I think we had reached some agreement about what they were doing, that they were willing to go public with. But that took an awful long time, and they didn't agree with my analysis at all at the beginning. <laughs> and um, so I just think it's one of those complicated things about the status of our scholarship when we're writing about people who could have written the book too, <laughs> but they'd write a different book, you know. And so then, anyway, I just think it's a normatively interesting question about our relationship to those sources. And Jamal, can I say one thing about that just very quickly? I thought what was very notable, Kim, is that Yvonne leans quite hard on the work of Jacqueline Neo in relation to Singapore, who is closer to developments there. Now, Yvonne knows Singapore well, but she's not an insider to Singapore. She's more of an insider to Malaysia. And she, she 
cites Jacqueline really consistently. And I think Jacqueline's very close to on the ground understanding of what's saying too much and what's not saying too much. And she's a very good uh, read, if you like, of the Singaporean political dynamic. What can be said that the Chief Justice would be okay with, what can't be said. And I actually thought that, Yvonne, you're, you were very collegial in how you engage with um, Jacqueline's work, but it also kind of overcame some of the concerns that Kim raises about, like, what are you doing sitting in DC telling us what the Singaporean judges are doing? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you, in, you rely on the Singaporean scholars very deftly to, to kind of overcome some of Kim's concern. Right. I think, I think um, again, and this goes back to the, the, the Malaysia-Singapore uh, distinction that is done. I think, like, the story, the more, well, to me, and I might be biased, but I think Rand said this too, the Malaysian story is more interesting in, in this particular context for the idea of strategic judicial empowerment and what the judges have been doing. So what I'm doing is really saying like, here's kind of like what the, the account, the rich account of what's going on here. And uh, the, in the Singaporean context, like they may or may not, you know, move in this direction. Uh, but the story, I think like the story here that is different and novel, I think, and I think an interesting uh, and an interesting experience that we're seeing in the Malaysian context is one I think that the the past like five to ten years have told much more have been much have been interesting, particularly in the Malaysian context. And so to Kim's point, also I, I I you know it's true that you can't get into the minds of judges in the way that we're that we're suggesting because then statecraft might not work. But I think it's illustrative that for the cases that I use as strategic as this idea of judicial strategy. If you look, if you just look at them, um, the strands that you can draw out that shows, I think, like some degree of statecraft or strategy, the first case in the 2017 case, it's a pretty, it's like a very mobby S type of moment. So pragmatic case on land acquisition, no one really cares. The, ju the judges, you know, it ends up being a unanimous decision where the, where the judge who writes the opinion brings in all this stuff about judicial, essentially, the government not being able to take away judicial review about separation of powers being critical and sacrosanct and all of these things. And then the next year, in a year, in what is then a fraud case of religion and jurisdictional elements between civil and Sharia courts, they then rely, you know, on the on the previous case. It's sort of a very it's a very legal move, right? You know, look at our precedent. It's a well established like, principle that judicial independence and separation of powers is critical and sacrosanct, and therefore we will essentially re nullify this constitutional interpretation, this constitutional amendment here on the uh, purview of the civil courts over the Sharia courts. And in the process also say that the government cannot create any constitutional amendments that, uh, that, that undermine these principles. So I think there's something to be said for even for seeing the judicial statecraft strands, just even based on the types of decisions that the judges are doing here. And, one last thing I'll say is that it's noticeable how in these cases, one shift that has happened is that the, the judges very much locate the types of tools they're now using, like proportionality in the Malaysian constitution itself. So Article 5 on you know, equal protection or the purpose of interpretation of, say, the Malaysia's Article 3 religion clause, right? Islam's the religion of the federation, but other religions may be used in peace and harmony, using the peace and harmony instead as like to, to found this purposive interpretation. So instead of kind of pulling in the sort of, it's a, it's a Western liberal conception that we're bringing in of religious freedom or we're bringing in of uh, proportionality, it's very much being presented as a homegrown uh, tied to the actual constitutional context that we're looking at here. So uh, Mark Graber has been waiting very patiently, uh, so I will turn it to him. Okay, well first, thank you to everyone just for a terrific panel. I very much look forward to the book. My first question, Yvonne, is when is Oxford going to send it, having ordered the thing? Have, um, I, it, it's been, have you not got it? We should, we should figure this out, if not. Yeah. Um, I'll add, by the way, the real virtue of writing on the 19th century is no one I have ever written about is pushed back. <laughs> is a good thing. But it occurred to me in the discussion that something is going on in Asia that violates some canons of American legal realism. So there's a fairly robust literature in the United States that the judge's preferred method of argument doesn't matter much. 
So in fact, we have people um, calling themselves originalists and lo and behold, it turns out that the framers in 1787 just endorsed the Republican Party platform of 2020, who knew? And I'm wondering what features of uh, the countries you say that make these tools matter, or is it the case that what Roz might call an A plus judge, if you said you're not allowed to use proportionality, we we'll just find another way of getting a very similar result. Right. Um, so I think to I think the preferred I think the method of argument, judicial argument, matters when the court is fragile. I mean, it matters more when the court is fragile. I should say, and I think the. Um, you know, it may well be that, as Raz said, with the uh, American, the U.S. Supreme Court context, you know, they, they different tools, like different tools in different contexts make sense, right? Whereas, like, I think in a context where uh, for many of these courts or judges who are trying to strike this fine balance between asserting some degree or finding some way to assert authority and yet not and not at the same time not upset the consolidated political power, the governing powers, the types of I think like the way in which the legal the legal reasoning or judicial reasoning is framed, I think probably does make a difference in order to appear as as legalistic as possible in some context for like for that type of statecraft to work, um, and also I think to and also to negotiate that institutional balance of power with when they are in a constitutional context uh, that has powerful political actors that may they may well intrude on the judicial turf. So I think like to that extent, like it's probably why I think the specific judicial adjudication strategies that are used um, and how they're used and when they're used, like the timing of it matters as well in the decision matters in these contexts. I wonder, Yvonne, whether maybe you're, uh, maybe I'm saying the same thing you just said, but I, I, I wonder if part of what you're suggesting is that it, it's, it's not that these particular strategies are determinative of some particular outcome. And, and so in that sense, it's consistent with what Marcus said, but that it still matters uh, because, or insofar as uh, pr strategies have expressive elements to them. So if you choose to say you're an originalist, right, you're communicating something, and that's a, in the space of political rhetoric, um, not in the space of um, determining some, uh, some particular outcome. And that maybe you're communicating something different, something else when you say you're into proportionality. Uh, maybe you're communicating something about being part of a community of, of judges or, um, uh, I don't know, um, is, is, that, uh, is that consistent with your thinking? I, yes, I think that's that's very much consistent with um, thinking that it's not the specific tools that are themselves, I think, magically predictive or deterministic in some way. The tools are not, the tools can be used in different contexts to different ends, I think, as Roz mentioned earlier. But I think in this, I think in this context, it is the um, it's both the what you call expressive value of the tools, but it's also the idea that you have capable judges and who are looking for ways to perform their role along a certain dimension, then these are the types of uh, tools or constitutional reasonings that those types of judges might be able to use to good effect. So I, I do have my own um, very quick question, but if, uh, if there are others uh, in the audience who have questions, uh, I think we do have a, a, few, a few more minutes uh, in which you can uh, jump on the queue. Uh, I was going to um, I wanted to follow up with what Ron said earlier about 2020 um, and see if you had an update for us, because as I count back and do the math that you're finishing this book uh, right, as, uh, right as there's quite a lot of churn in Malaysian politics, uh, in recent days, uh, I think there's been some more churn. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just curious whether, 
A, to get an update from someone who's an insider, uh, but also or more of an insider than any uh, than any, anyone else in the panel. And, and but B, uh, does does anything that's happened in 2020, uh, you know, would, would you have written any part of the book differently if if the book finished next year, a year from now, um, instead of right now? Um, you know, we all, we all write books and then things happen and then you 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 wonder you, know, you 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 fiddle on the edges because the public it's you know it's due tomorrow. But I'm just wondering if if this would generate any insights or if it's consistent in some way with the story that you're telling. Right. So you said I was finishing the book and actually finished the book just before March 2020 happened, and so uh, February 2020 I should say happened. So there is an author's note at the start of the book that deals with the 2020, which is what Oxford let me do. And then I tried to do like little fiddling right all across, like as Rand noted in the last second, the second paragraph before the conclusion in a bunch of places in the introduction and here and across the book um, to take into account what happened. For those who might not be as familiar, in 2018, what had happened was that Malaysia had its first ever change of government. A democratic transition was seen as sort of this democratic success story. And then in 2020, that government collapsed. Um, and the what was called the Alliance of Hope collapsed and and has been, it's currently, it, it, and now just in the last week, Anwar Ibrahim, who did not become prime minister in February 2020, has claimed that he has enough MPs to become uh, prime minister and form another new government. So there's all this like, like political shenanigans going on where they're talking to the king, the constitutional monarch, um, trying to show who has the command of the majority. Uh, Mahathir, obviously, who was this strong strongman, was the prime minister in February 2020, got deposed from power. And then you have, since then, all these different political personalities, Muhyiddin, Najib, Anwar, coming up and, uh, and all staking their claim to power. And I think my basic, and so I think my basic claim, though, is that I think, if anything, I think uh, support, I, I, I think, like, if anything, like, it, it, it supports the basic claim of the book which is that political crises such as these underscore that we really need to move away from this idea of governance tied to particular individuals and particular personalities and epic political dramas and the idea that the change in government in and of itself, the change of political parties, which as we've seen, can change and, and on a dime. Like, you know, regimes change, political destinies are uncertain, popular narratives are fickle. And so, I, and so my account in the book is an institutional account, right? It's an account that it is all the more important to strengthen constitutional institutions like the courts that can help with constructing and enduring constitutional democracy. And it's, and I think in the book, like one of the things I say is that the, it, it reads like a Greek drama, some of the, the political shenanigans that have happened, right? It's like it unfolds along these themes of power, glory, betrayal, reconciliation, Mahathir and Anwar, and then irony and a betrayal again. But we should remember that Greek dramas can may end in redemption, but they can also end in tragedy. So for, I think, a constitutional democracy, particularly one that is inherently fragile to thrive, whether in Malaysia or elsewhere, I think requires shifting away from a preoccupation with that kind of uh, with that kind of heroic personality narrative and focusing on the building and strengthening of effective institutions, of which I think the courts are certainly one are, are a huge part of that, a crucial part of that. I'm not, I think there are other constitutional institutions, democratic institutions that are also hugely important, but I think the courts in the context of the types of democracies we're looking at here have have immense potential to do more because they haven't been they haven't had the political space to do that in the past and two and i think that's the kind of institution i think needs to we need to focus on to build and strengthen uh constitutional democracy and avoid constitutional tragedy so I think the short answer is no. I think the book central claim wouldn't have changed, but um, it would have maybe spared some some drama when I was trying to redo the page proofs for this particular book. Tom, do you have a, a 30 second uh, intervention? Exactly, 30 seconds. I think actually the 2020 illustrates uh, or helps you respond to Ron's point that isn't the sample really small. We only have these three cases because in 2020 we've seen remarkable things. Mahathir Muhammad going to court <laughs> to try to get this uh, Muyadin's guys out of the speakership. So that's pretty interesting. Um, and also, of course, Najib being convicted 
is remarkable. And right. I don't know, I'm an outsider. I don't know if that's just like Anwar Ibrahim being convicted of sodomy, but it strikes me that it does indicate some actual capacity. They weren't certainly bribed. Uh, and so um, maybe, maybe Yvonne's book is right. And we'll be looking back and seeing how prescient she was. I will say the Najib, the Najib, so this was the hugely corrupt prime minister, 1MDB, uh, that was deposed from power. And I will say this one thing, which is that everyone thought after the political regime changed earlier this year, that that meant he was going to get away scot-free because now his folks are back in power. If it was purely a, a case of, I think, the political context and the courts responding to that, that was an out, like that should not have happened, right? They, that Najib should have gotten away in that court case. And yet the high court, not even the highest court in the land, the high court, which is the first tier appellate court before the court of the federal court, um, convicts him of all seven charges of corruption. It's the first time a prime minister, a former prime minister has ever been convicted um, and does it in a fairly robust decision. So yes, when I saw that, which just happened in June, I think I, like it was, um, I think a good account for the idea that I think the courts have become more assertive and are feeling, and, and even so, when faced with what is now, again, uh, one with a dominant political power in the opposite direction. So, uh, so I am cautiously optimistic, I think is how I would characterize myself. So uh, with apologies, Ross, because we're, we're, we're at time, uh, I will uh, close this panel. I want to say thank you to all the panelists and especially thank you to Yvonne for and a hearty congratulations on uh, this wonderful book. So uh, thanks to everyone and uh, take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for all, to all the panelists. Thank you, Jamal, Ran, uh, Raz, and Tom. Such a pleasure to see you all. And I wish I could get you all a drink now. If we were together, I would definitely push for that, but maybe next time. Thank you, eh? Thank you. Thank you, Maximo. Thank you, Thank you for...